The next topic in the book is that of positive operators, positive definite and positive semi-definite, and that will allow us to complete this uh, correspondence between complex numbers and normal matrices. We've already uh, realized the, these correspondences, real numbers correspond to self-adjoint matrices, numbers on the unit circle correspond to unitary matrices. So this side is a generalization to higher dimensions of this side. We need, want to, I want to finish this correspondence here. But before I discuss positive operators, I'm going to digress a bit and talk about spectral resolutions because it will be useful to us when we discuss positive operators. To be honest with you, uh, initially I was not going to talk about spectral resolutions in this course, but I think that upon further reflection, I really should do so. This is, after all, supposed to be a comprehensive course. So <clears throat> it starts with orthogonal projections and resolutions of the identity. You will recall, I hope, that if <clears throat> we have a direct sum decomposition of a vector space, <clears throat> then the projection map, rho st, <clears throat> maps v to s, every vector little v is a little s plus a little t, little s belongs to the subspace capital S and same for t, and then rho st of v is s. We are <clears throat> projecting onto s along t. So uh, if you need to review that, please do so, because that's we're, we're going to rely heavily on projections. <clears throat> Two projections. We, we've also, by the way, discussed the notion of an orthogonal projection in an inner product space. If, S, if, if V is an inner product space and S and T are orthogonal subspaces, we would then change the notation and write this way, then this projection is called an orthogonal projection because we're projecting along, onto S along its orthogonal complement. But <clears throat> there's another use of the term orthogonal. It's a bit confusing, but it's possible for two projections to be orthogonal to each other. And that has nothing to do with whether each projection separately is orthogonal or not. It doesn't make any difference. It's uh, just sort of an unfortunate choice of terminology, maybe, but it makes some sense. Two projection operators, rho and sigma on V, are orthogonal to each other. And most people would just say orthogonal, so that's even more dangerous. If the composition of the two, both ways, rho sigma and sigma rho, is zero. And then we would write rho perpendicular, this is the perpendicular sign, rho perpendicular sigma. It, as, as a very simple example, <clears throat> for any projection rho, we can take I, iota minus rho, that's also a projection, and these products are zero. So these two projections are orthogonal. <clears throat> In case you're wondering, wouldn't it be enough just to have rho sigma zero <clears throat> or sigma rho zero? The answer is no. You need both of these. And here is an example that shows that the, uh, first of all, the compositions in uh, in each order are different. And um, <clears throat> so th there, it's possible for these two compositions, rho sigma and sigma rho, to be different, but it's also possible that the composition of two projections 
in one way is zero, which is a projection, but in the other way, when you reverse the two, it's not even a projection. So, it, so the various things can happen here, and I'll let you study this example. But the point here is that you do need to check that both compositions are zero for orthogonality. It's part of the definition and is required. Another way to say that rho sigma is zero is to say that <clears throat> the kernel of sigma contains the image of, I'm sorry, the kernel of rho contains the image of sigma Because when you apply rho sigma to a vector v, you first apply sigma, you are then in the image of sigma. Rho has to kill that. So the kernel of rho contains the image of sigma. So orthogonality requires that to happen in both directions. <clears throat> Here's the kernel of rho contains the image of sigma. Here's the kernel of sigma contains the image of rho. Sometimes this is useful. Now to the point. <clears throat> we can write the identity operator as a sum of two orthogonal projections very easily. Take rho, any projection rho, and iota minus rho. Those are orthogonal, and their sum, of course, is the identity. And that can be generalized. <clears throat> a resolution of the identity on V is the sum of this form where the row i's are pairwise orthogonal projections. In other words, two different indices, the two projections are orthogonal to each other. Again, this says nothing about whether an individual projection is an orthogonal projection or not. It makes no difference. It's not relevant whatsoever. In fact, V may not even be an inner product space. Uh, so we may not have orthogonal complements because we don't have we don't we have don't have an inner product or haven't specified it. This is valid for vector spaces in general. Now <clears throat> there's a direct connection between resolutions of the identity on V and direct sum decompositions of V. So, for example, in one direction, if I have a resolution of the identity and I take a vector v, then v is equal to the identity applied to v. I can distribute, and this is a member of the sum of the images of all the, re of all the projections. So, the vector space can be decomposed into a sum of the images of the members of the resolution of the identity. This is also a direct sum. Because if we took a sum of vectors from each of these subspaces, it would look like this and set it equal to zero then if we apply rho sub i to both sides, sorry I got interrupted by a phone call and I've lost track of exactly where I was, but um, <clears throat> to see that this sum is direct, we'll take a sum of vectors, one from each subspace, set it equal to zero. If we apply rho sub i to both sides, that's where I think I was, then using the orthogonality and the item potency of projections, uh, applying rho i to this is just everything's going to get killed except the one uh, term. It'll be rho i squared v i equals zero, but rho i squared is equal to rho i because the, of the item potency. So this will tell us that rho i v equals zero. In other words, if we take a sum of vectors from these subspaces, set it equal to zero, all the vectors had to be zero. That means that this sum is direct. So <clears throat> this V is 
a direct sum of the images of the projections. That's how we go from a resolution of the identity to a direct sum decomposition. <clears throat> As to the kernels of these projections, if we if we decompose a vector v as a, as a sum of vectors from the images here, then v sub i, uh, rho sub i of v will be zero if and only if <clears throat> rho sub i applied to this sum is zero. We distribute. Again, uh, we're going to get a lot of zeros here because when we apply rho sub i to anything in the image, of rho sub j, for j different from i, it's going to be zero. So we'll just come out with rho i ui equals zero, and that means that ui is zero. <clears throat> so if so, a vector v is in the kernel of rho i if and only if it is a sum of vectors from all the other images not the image of rho sub i, the other images. So <clears throat> the kernel of rho sub i is this direct sum, the images of the rho sub j's, j different from i. So we see then that a resolution of the identity produces a direct sum decomposition of v where the sum ends are the images of the projections, and we even have information about the kernels of those projections. Conversely, if we start with a direct sum decomposition of V, and we let rho sub i be projection onto S sub i along the direct sum of the other subspaces, I've used this notation here. I've never seen this before, but it seems like a good notation. This is the direct sum of all the S sub J's except S sub I. So I write that as S sub not I. This symbol is the one of the logical symbols for negation. So S sub not I means sum all of the s's, but not si. <clears throat> so this direct sum, uh, the, the sum of the projections then, is the identity. And these projections are orthogonal to each other, so we get a resolution of the identity, and the kernel is S sub not I. I'll let you fill in the details there. Oh, maybe I did it for you. So, <clears throat> because if I is different from J, then the image of rho I, which is S I, is contained in the kernel of rho J, so they're orthogonal. Also, <clears throat> if V is uh, a sum of vectors in S, so V is an arbitrary vector in V, written as a sum of vectors from the subspaces, <clears throat> then uh, each of these vectors, say, take S1, for example, it's in the image, it's in S1, which is the image of rho sub 1, it's rho sub 1 of V is S1, so this is equal to rho 1 of v at, uh, plus all the way up to rho k of v, which is this sum of the rows applied to v. So the sum of these uh, projections is the identity. So we get a resolution of the identity. So we can go back and forth. If we start with a resolution of the identity, then the images of those resolutions give us a direct sum decomposition, and here's the kernel, in case we need it. Conversely, <clears throat> if we start with a direct sum decomposition and take projections onto the subspaces along the direct sum of all the other subspaces, 
that's a resolution of the identity. So we can go back and forth. They're, they're equivalent concepts, different ways of looking at the same thing. That's very interesting. Direct sum decompositions are essentially the same as a decomposition of the identity map into projections. And this is something we're going to elaborate on <clears throat> and generalize uh, coming next. Okay, so let's take a look at generalizing the resolutions of the identity. We've just seen that they correspond to direct sum decompositions. <clears throat> we can generalize this for diagonalizable linear operators. So let's say we have um, a diagonalizable diagonalizable linear operator. Uh, saying that tau is diagonalizable is equivalent to saying that V is the direct sum of its eigenspaces. And that corresponds to a resolution of the identity. But there's a little bit special going on here because these are eigenspaces. So if we take the projection rho sub k onto the eigenspace e lambda k along this complement e sub naught lambda k, this is the same notation we just used uh, in more general context, <clears throat> then we get, um, then we can write tau, our diagonalizable linear operator, as a sum, it would be tau times the identity, which is this sum, and we distribute. And so tau is tau rho 1 plus dot 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 plus tau rho m. But we need to take a closer look at these little operators, these compositions. If we take a vector from the eigenspace E lambda i, rho i is not going to do anything to it. So tau rho i v is the same as tau of v, which is lambda i v, because v is an eigenvector, and that's lambda i rho i of v. If we take a vector from a different eigenspace, e, rho, e lambda j, j different from i, then <clears throat> the rho i is going to kill that vector, and we'll get zero before we even get to tau. But that could also be written as lambda i rho i of v. So in either case, we get the same formula. And since it applies to vectors anywhere in this direct sum decomposition, it applies to every vector in v, so tau rho i is the same as lambda i rho i. So tau is a linear combination of these projections onto the eigenspaces, and the eigenvalues are the coefficients. This is an obvious direct generalization of resolution of the identity. <clears throat> So, definition, a spectral resolution of a diagonalizable operator tau is a decomposition of this form where the rho i's form a resolution of the identity. If you add them up, you get the identity, and the lambda i's are distinct. So, a diagonalizable operator has a spectral resolution, where the projections are uh, uh, projections onto the eigenspaces along the direct sum of the other eigenspaces. But the converse also holds. If we have an operator with a spectral resolution like this, then tau must be diagonalizable. 
<clears throat> since, ta since this sum is a resolution of the identity, there is this decomposition we have of V into the direct sum of the images of the projections. And if we take a vector from one of those images, it has the form rho i of v for some vector v, and apply tau to that, that's the same as applying this linear combination, the orthogonality means most of these are going to get killed away. Rho j, rho i is 0 if j and i are different. All that survives is lambda i rho i squared v, or in other words, lambda i rho i v. And so if we apply tau to this image, this vector in the image of rho i, we get lambda i times that vector. In other words, that vector is an eigenvector, or zero. And so the image is contained in the eigenspace. The image of rho j is contained in the eigenspace E lambda j for all j. <clears throat> and so V is the sum of these images, each one contained in the corresponding eigenspace, but all that's contained in V, so we have equality here. And so V is the direct sum of the eigenspaces of tau, which means tau is diagonalizable. There's an eigenbasis for tau, uh, for V with respect to tau. And <clears throat> so now we have another characterization of diagonalizability, something we discussed a while ago. Uh, in two separate places, actually, in the lectures. Once we had the concept of the minimal polynomial, we could add some a, a new characterization of diagonalizability. Now we've got yet another characterization. A linear operator is diagonalizable if and only if it has a spectral resolution. And when it does, these guys the coefficients are form the spectrum. Actually, yes, because they're distinct, they form the spectrum. The image of each projection is the eigenspace. The kernel is the sum, direct sum, of the other eigenspaces. <clears throat> now, we, all, we learned way back in Chapter 2 that <clears throat> distinct well, we, what we learned told, will tell us now that distinct eigenspace projections are orthogonal. Okay. And I'm going to let you reflect on that. It has something to do with linear independence, but I'll let you think about that. <clears throat> and so if we take a spectral resolution which is the operator tau in spectral resolution form, and we raise it to a power, for example. We raise this linear combination to a power. As you do this computation, the orthogonality is going to mean that most of these terms will cancel, and the fact that the projections are idempotent means we'll never get beyond the first power of any of the projections, so it all sorts out when the smoke clears just to this. In other words, raising a spectral resolution to the kth power just amounts to a raise, raising the lambdas, the coefficients, to the kth power. This is the spectral resolution of tau to the k. And more generally, for any polynomial p of x, the operator p of tau has this spectral resolution. So we've found a very convenient way to do the algebra of diagonalizable operators using spectral resolutions. And this worked so well for polynomials in tau, why not just define an operator via its spectral resolution? 
So we could define the square root of tau and define it by setting it to equal to this. There's a little difference here, what we're doing. P of tau already existed as an operator. This, was, this is its spectral resolution. Square root of tau is a new operator we're defining by giving a spec, what we will call a spectral resolution. We could do e to the tau. We could do sine of tau. We could do all sorts of functions of tau. In general, if we have any function, set function, from the spectrum of tau to the base field, well-defined function, we can define a new linear operator. So here is the definition. And this is what I just said. <clears throat> tau is diagonalizable. We have this decomposition where these are the distinct eigenvalues. We take projection. Uh, rho sub i is what we'll call an eigenspace projection. It's projection onto e sub lambda i along the sum of the other eigenspaces. Any function f, set function, we get an operator, and we will call this sum the spectral resolution of this operator. <clears throat> As a consequence of the both the idempotence and the orthogonality of eigenspace projections, we have a theorem concerning how to compose two operators that are defined by their spectral resolutions. And if you were to work out f of tau, g of tau, in all its gory detail, again, the orthogonality of the projections and their idempotence would give you just this single uh, linear combination where the, the uh, projections occur only to the first power and there's no cross products. And so this is would generally be written just this way. You can take the composition of two operators expressed in terms of their um, spectral resolutions by taking the product of the two functions, f and g, and apply that to tau. So this side is a product, this side is a composition. A couple of examples of spectral resolutions. You know, this is not a formula you should be memorizing. There is a time to memorize and a time not to memorize. You need to memorize definitions, you need to memorize statements of theorems, unless they are so, they are easy to recall. You should think about this until you can just say to yourself, how do I multiply these two, how do I compose these two together? Well, here is how, without having to actually remember or memorize this. Okay. So, if tau is invertible and diagonalizable, remember all this applies only to diagonalizable linear operators, and it has this spectral resolution, and if the eigenvalues are all non-zero, they have uh, multiplicative inverses, the spectral resolution of tau inverse will be this. And I'll leave that for you to verify. <clears throat> a complex number, as you may very well know, can be written in polar form. Z equals R e to the i theta. R is non-negative, it's the modulus of Z, and theta is the argument. The argument is determined only up to addition by multiples of 2 pi. Uh, but there is something called the principal value of the argument, or the principal argument. And there is some variation on how that's chosen. Uh, I think most often it's negative pi to pi. Sometimes it could be 0 to 2 pi. Um, but we'll stick with this one. 
And that means the argument is now single-valued. Every uh, complex number has a unique principal value of its argument, or principal argument. The principal square root of a complex number is defined here. You take the positive, or I should actually, it's the non-negative square root, <coughs> and the principal value of the argument. For zero, this is a little bit nasty, so we're going to assume z is not zero if you want. Well, then, if tau is diagonalizable <coughs> and has this spectral resolution, the principal square root of tau is given by this formula, where these square roots are the principal square roots. For zero, <coughs> The modulus is zero, uh, so we don't have to worry about... Uh, there's no problem if one of the lambda i's is zero. And we'll leave it to you to do this computation. It's straightforward. Now I have a bit of bad news. <clears throat> it may be fun and exotic to define square root of tau, e to the tau, sine tau, whatever. But it's not quite as exciting as it may seem, because we're not really getting anything new. And that is a consequence of what is called the Lagrange interpolation formula. Basically what it says is that if you have distinct elements of a field and any function there's a polynomial that gives the same values on the domain, which means that <clears throat> we don't get anything more than just polynomials in tau. e to the tau, sine tau, square root of tau, they're all just polynomials in tau. And the formula, the Lagrange interpolation formula, gives you the polynomial corresponding to the function. So that's a little bit unfortunate in some ways, but it still doesn't render this, uh, these exotic functions useless. Sometimes it's helpful to think of the square roots and the exponentials of operators. So that's what's going on here. That's a summary. But there is one other thing to note. A polynomial in tau commutes with tau, commutes with any operator that commutes with tau. So the operator f of tau, being a polynomial in tau, will commute with any operator sigma that commutes with tau. So sigma tau equals tau sigma implies sigma f of tau equals f of tau sigma. And that can be useful. The study of the properties of functions of an operator is known as the functional calculus of the operator. So we are just dipping a little bit into the functional calculus. But the downer is that it's really the same as the polynomial calculus, which is nothing new. But I should add that even though the functional calculus of linear operators on a finite dimensional vector space amounts to just the study of polynomials of operators, that's not the case for infinite dimensional vector spaces. And that's where the functional calculus really comes into its own. In the context of certain special types of infinite dimensional vector spaces known as Banach algebras, but that's a subject um, well outside the scope of our present lecture series, so we won't be mentioning that again.